I can't explain why I feel such a warm glow of nostalgia uh, when I think about drive-in movies, but I do. And I think of them now, of course, from my vantage point years after going to them, as a wonderful part of Americana. It was a great era. Uh, I love the look of You could put your them. seat back and put your feet up and be comfy and cozy. It, it was big escapism. Uh, you know, this is where the guy who worked all day in the railroad. the kids up in the station wagon. And you just kind of kick back and you watch the movie. And it's, it's just great. And have a good old smoochy time. Wanted to do everything Plus, but watch the movie. My mother and father were in the car and if we were ready at the playground. the playground. I saw Star Wars. And drive in. And, and a drive in. Just get the hell out of this world and back to one and another. Drive in movie, I think you remember as you would your first kiss, your first car, your prom, those innocent times that you spent as a child with your family. Good evening, folks, and a hearty welcome to our drive-in theater. It was a simpler way of life, and I think that's probably the thing that uh, young people today uh, are missing out on. I don't think they have the fun that we had. I don't think they have the nostalgia or the mystery that we had. No, I've never been to a drive-in. No, I have never been to a drive-in theater. I'm 20 years old and I've never gone. <laughs> they missed a real good close-up kissing lesson. We used to go all the time, maybe every other weekend. And I remember we saw Con Air. I liked the food a lot. Why don't you try a juicy, good hot dog? I, I've always wanted to order popcorn at the drive-in. It's at the concession stand now. There aren't a lot of people now that have that experience. I couldn't even tell you why, why the drive-in disappeared or, or what happened. <laughs> First, the mere existence of a motion picture was so astonishing to people that that was enough. And so the first Lumiere Brothers film in France was of a train arriving at a station. And that's all it is, a train pulling in. But people gasped. In fact, people ducked because they didn't understand the concept that this was a flat image and the train wasn't going to burst through the screen somehow and run them over. Eventually, films got longer and they started telling stories. If it's the 1900s and you're going to the movies in the summertime, it's hot in that theater. So somebody got this brilliant idea to start showing movies outdoors. And we'd uh, sit on the ground, we'd take a blanket or whatever to sit on because uh, there was no, no seats or no chairs. We, we watched the movie, but uh, there, was, there was no, no sound. That was a big deal, to get to go up there and see a movie. Uh, that was really a big thrill in our lives. In fact, that's one way the military would often be entertained, is servicemen would often be shown these movies outdoors. And not just the servicemen on land, but the servicemen at sea as well. I mean, they would stretch out these screens between the masts of the ship. And one day, this businessman from New Jersey got an idea to add one more element to the outdoor movie-going experience. <laughs> Richard Hollingshead opened the first drive-in movie theater on June 6, 1933 in Camden, New Jersey. Richard Hollingshead was a businessman and one of the reasons that people say he developed drive-ins is his mother was somewhat overweight and by doing the drive-in patent he was able to get his mother to go to the movie because she just simply couldn't fit in a seat in an indoor theater. While people were waiting in line to get gas at a gas station, at that time you did have to wait for a while to get your gas. And so his original idea was just to run movies at some location where they could be seen by cars waiting in line. Uh, he then expanded that to, uh, to just to show a movie every night and uh, have a circle of cars that would watch the movie. But the invention that he came up with was so popular, the first night it was completely sold out, that the drive-in caught on. There is something neat that's about the communal experience of going to the drive-in uh, that made it different from paying your money and going into a darkened theater. <laughs> Well, he designed a patent system for the ramps. That's what he designed was the way that the cars would pull up to the screen. They were just like mounds that he would, that were graded up. 
and he tried to patent the, this process thinking that he could do this and then everyone else that wanted to open up a drive-in would have to pay him to do so. And other people couldn't get into business because the ramps were patented. Finally, the court saw, decreed that, uh, that this was, they couldn't do this. He sued people all of his life trying to enforce his patent, which would ended up by not being able to be enforced and drive-in owners went on and built drive-ins without paying Hollings Head. Oh, that poor man. And his invention, which he thought would make him a lot of money by just sitting back and letting people live up to his patents, that didn't work. And you had all these people, merchants, uh, all candlestick makers, uh, all sorts, got in the drive-in theater business. <laughs> It's our pleasure to welcome you to your friendly drive-in theater. Well, the idea of the drive-in becoming an innocent place like the local barbershop where everyone gathered was kind of an accident because everybody that built a drive-in was basically in it for the money. The drive-in made a lot of money. It was kind of a white trash get rich scheme. You would hear somebody talking in, from the next town that they built this drive-in and it's actually very, very cheap to build a drive-in. You have to do two things. You have to put up a screen and a projection booth and you have to grade the uh, lot so that it's, so that you have the cars pointing upward. And other than that, everything else is kind of window dressing at a drive-in. So it was considered this incredibly cheap investment at a time when land was cheap. And the, and the land was cheap. These were mom and pop operations. So if somebody owned a barber shop in town, they decided to invest in a drive-in. So the drive-in owners were a different breed. They were people that went out and put up a screen, got some old movies, and started showing movies out in fields. Drive-ins were very unsophisticated. They had no gravel, they had no asphalt. When it was muddy, your car got stuck. But drive-in owners were true entrepreneurs. They were people who knew nothing about the movie business. They made their money by simply having people come, pay admissions, and then also by selling food. The food, the concessions, if you will, were very primitive as well. And you might just, when you drove up to buy your ticket, they might just be having little hand-packed sacks of popcorn that they would sell, and maybe some sodas there. It wasn't the big fancy concession stand like most people think of going to the drive-in and getting food. It's refreshment time, and our refreshment stand is loaded with good things to eat. There's crispy, crunchy popcorn, lots of candy, and frosty, refreshing cold drinks. Drive-ins uh, never did get first-run product like indoor movie theaters do, but the drive-ins took movies that had been out for three or four months. And in order to uh, buy a film, you went to, say, Paramount or Fox or Warner Brothers and told them you wanted to buy the film. Right at first, the drive-ins played last run. Some drive-ins were so far out in the country, they would be 10 or 12 miles from downtown that what would happen is the mailman might bring the prints out if he felt like it. Uh, the milkman who came out with milk, they might give him the prints just to drop off at the drive-in. A lot of times the drive-in owners would send somebody who worked for them into town uh, to a pre-arranged place where the prints would be left. I mean, they might be left in front of a hardware store, uh, they might be left in front of an uh, indoor movie theater, because nobody wanted to travel that far. I mean, a lot of these drive-in theaters were really out in the country. There were only about a hundred drive-ins in this country prior to World War II. Movie going reached its peak during World War II. People have always used movies as their escape from reality, and sometimes it's a very necessary escape. There are always wonderful new pictures to see, delightful snacks to nibble, a gay, pleasant evening for all. And because of gas rationing, building material shortages, the government prohibited any non-essential construction. About half of the drive-in movie theaters that were open closed, and if you were lucky to live in a town that had a defense plant, those drive-ins had midnight shows, they had two o'clock shows, they had shows where people who got through from their shift at the airplane plant could go to the drive-in. The drive-in theater that was camouflaged in Los Angeles during the war was the Sand Valley, and it was near a, one of the major um, 
airframe manufacturing plants uh, and a very strategic defense department uh, location. So the sand veil was uh, camouflaged so that it wouldn't look like something to either bomb or go after and also lead people into thinking that it was an installation that should be taken out. Oh, a word of caution. Don't drive over 10 miles an hour in the theater area for your safety's sake. And mom or pop, go with the kids when they leave the car. So at the end of World War II, when the soldiers returned home, people had cash, people had money, they were buying cars and they were buying homes. Everything was booming, absolutely everything. There was money and families were together and it was all about family togetherness. The immediate post-war years were the biggest boom the movie box office had ever seen. People were starved for entertainment. Things start changing after the war. The community starts spreading out. And the drive-ins followed uh, suburbia. That as they built homes further out and created new suburban communities, there were no theaters out there. And land was cheap. And the, and the land was cheap. So now it's natural that they would be building. <laughs> Drive-in movie theaters were being built everywhere. 700 drive-ins had opened in 1947 or 1948. The owners of drive-ins were smart enough and they took drive-ins where uh, the people were living, those new communities. And the drive-in, which was once the domain of the farmer, now became dominated by corporations and businessmen. Yeah, there are a few nicknames for drive-ins. Uh, Ozoner was invented by Variety. Hardtop was invented to distinguish an indoor theater from a, from a drive-in. Well, not only that, something else you didn't mention, that was the beginning of the big screen, too. You know, you really, uh, uh, their screens were much bigger than uh, the, uh, your indoor theaters. A gentleman named Jack Corgan was the first licensed architect in Texas. He built over 75 drive-ins. He used the idea of a grain elevator as his basic design. And there was Jack Vogel, who was building drive-ins in the Midwest. And then there was S. Charles Lee, who actually got his beginning building indoor These theaters. These are three men that are particularly known for their drive-in design and construction. These were designed by Dick V. Mitchell. He owned a company called Texas Sign Company in Fort Worth. He went on and did neon creations for all types of things. When they were originally built in the late 40s and early 50s, there was no prettier sign in America than that long a drive-in movie theater. And the thing that made them so dramatic is they had murals painted on the screen side facing the road, then those were accented in neon. And so when they were lit at night, they would make people who were out for a drive, see the drive-in, and, and make the driver feel like he was part of the show already, so he would want to come to the drive-in. A number of drive-in theater owners actually built their residence in the screen tower. And they did so because, first of all, they were at the drive-in very late into the morning. By having their residence built right into the screen tower, they didn't have to drive any distance at all. Somebody developed this, got a patent on this type of drive-in where there was an individual screen at each automobile. Some projection system that could project it onto all these screens at the same time. Part of the thrill of the drive-in was they were the biggest screens in the history of the movies. I think that the original thinking was that it, it gave more, uh, you know, gave you a better picture and more privacy. Your attention, please. If you're leaving the theater, please hang your speaker on the speaker stand before starting your car. Don't take chances on accidents which may damage your car. And the sound was always a problem at the drive-in, but it was especially a problem in the early days. They had big speakers up by the screen. The sound was just basically blown out over the car. Throw the sound out into the air. As you can well imagine, the people, the people in the front rows. They would get the sound first. The alarm and then left the room. 
And if you were on the back row. The sound always arrived late at the car. So often the sound didn't match the lips. I was on the other side of the screen. Uh, the other problem with that sound system was it created quite a bit of noise pollution. These caused noise complaints. People all over the neighborhood could hear the drive-in. They had to have ordinances that would quiet down these drive-ins. Drive-in owners tried all sorts of ways to perfect the projection of sound. They had drive-in speakers built into the ground where the sound was supposed to come up through the floorboard, which was a totally dumb thing. I don't know how the sound was going to get through the floorboard of a car, but somebody thought that this would happen. Even before the war, there were the little speakers that we all know of that we hung on our windows. RCA had the technology, but when the war came, they stopped uh, manufacturing them because it was not an essential item that they, the government felt that people needed. Uh, but after World War II, the individual speaker really became an essential part of every drive-in in America. Remove the speaker from the stand and place it in your car. Secondly, adjust the volume control to suit your requirements. Right for loud, left for soft. They were located near train tracks. If a train went by, made a lot of noise, or if it blew its whistle, sometimes the drive-in owners would try and raise their sound. I remember, too, that there were mosquitoes, and uh, this was unavoidable because you had to have the windows open a little uh, to put the hinged speaker on. I automatically, like a Rorschach test, associate drive-in and mosquitoes. And all kinds of contraptions were invented. One of them were nets you could buy, and they were little goofy nets, and you could roll down your window, and you would get fresh air in your car, but this would keep mosquitoes out. Someone was ingenious about inventing a little coil that smells a lot like incense when burned. It's called a pick, and set it on the dashboard of your car and light it. Light it and forget it. Pick's aroma keeps mosquitoes, gnats, and sand flies away. A pleasant aroma for you, but not for mosquitoes. We recently burned one in the car, and it just about drove us away. There were DDT trucks that would come around and spray the entire area. For a small fee, you could even have your car fumigated with DDT. Now, one of the oddest things that drive-ins ever invented was drive-in air conditioning systems. There would be a hose which you would stick inside your window just like you did your speaker. And then they would turn on an air conditioning system and air, cool air, could blow into your car. The problem was that rats loved to eat these tubes that were in the ground. So a little rat family would get down there, make their little family. The drive-in owner would come in and turn this air on, and bam, all these rats would be blown into their car. So if the science fiction movie didn't scare you, the rats in your car would. In the colder climates, the drive-in owner would occasionally invest in some little, sort of like a little space heater, if you will. We're happy to announce that we've installed burn somatic in-car heaters for your comfort and pleasure. The, the heater was this really bizarre contraption, it looked kind of like a miniature iron lung, you know, something that you would, uh, you know, give to elderly emphysema patients or something. Just roll down your front window and rest the heater's bracket on the window. The second you plugged it in, just a barrage of dust came out of it and, and it completely fogged up uh, all of the uh, windows in the car. Tilt the face of the heater towards the windshield and sit back and enjoy the show in healthful comfort. The drive-in owner was always fighting the elements. A full-scale Texas tornado occurred during the movie while we were watching it. I sat through Lawrence Arabia in a rainstorm. Right in the middle of the scene, I remember when Omar Sharif meets Peter O'Toole in the middle of the desert. It starts raining, and I had to watch the rest of the movie with the windshield wipers going on. And there were rain guards. There were drizzle guards. Drizzle guards are on sale now at the concession center. They were canvas tarps that were about six inches wide, and they went the whole length of your windshield, and they stuck on top and protruded out. That way, no longer will it be necessary to let rain spoil your fun. This drive-in theater will now remain open all year round. There have always been cold places where drive-ins are very popular. If I remember correctly, it was below zero that night. Initially, the problem was just finding a speaker that was not frozen 
permanently frozen to the pole. And this in itself was a bit like mushing the Iditarod just to get to the snack bar. So by the time I got back to the car, the Coke was frozen and the popcorn, you know, had about you know, four inches of snow on top of it. There was something particularly memorable about sitting in the middle of a mound of ice and snow watching a movie covered with ice and snow called The White Dawn. They would repaint the screens, and uh, and they would uh, would have to do the parking lot sometime. I to redo paving and upgrade the uh, Memorial Day, Fourth of July, and Labor Day were kind of that was the kind of the drive-in season. Uh, Memorial Day opened the season. In a drive-in, you're driving in. It's action. <laughs> They don't really appreciate what drive-ins really look like. Some of these drive-ins that were built, I mean, they were truly beautiful. Where you go out and everything was just so fresh and new and clean. But you have a chance to get out and walk around and know the people, see them and talk to them. It, it was interact. more social than and it then was about movies. The drive-ins was, a, they were an out. entire happening. It wasn't just for the movies. Getting yeah. to the drive-in. You would it was so exciting oh, yeah, that because was when you, you know, got to the booth, you paid really money, nice. people gave you a brochure. You were out there under the stars, you wanted to laugh at well, yourself. Well, it is an experience. It's Everyone could show up for dinner, spend all their money out at the concession stand, and, and then I by the time the movie started, you know, you give some uh, you give some medicine to the kids in the backseat so they fall asleep. And when I was very little, I remember being put in my pajamas in the backseat when we would go to the drive-in because they either figured I would fall asleep or perhaps hoped I would fall asleep. It was just a way of life in, in the 40s and 50s, and everybody liked it. And you had a romance with your car. It was truly magical. My brother would do anything. He and his friends used to love to go uh, sneak in, drive in movies. And they did it. And they'd never get caught. Why well, wouldn't do that? I had a couple of friends that we couldn't get the trunk open, couldn't pop the trunk open. If they sneaked into movies, they had to have a little bit more money to buy a Coke with. So we tried to talk them into just letting my date and I watch the movie, but you know they weren't going for that. You know, they did have uh, all kind of promotional things. Gimmicks. They weren't open in the daytime. They had to get the nighttime people. There, they had to bring people in, so they f were always figuring some gimmick, you know, like we buried bodies. In fact, we even had a contest. Uh, uh, would you dare being buried alive? We had a guy who volunteered, and we actually buried him alive. We buried him in front of the screen on the playground. They would make certain that the local Baptist minister was aware that they were going to do that, hoping that he would become furious about it and hoping that he would talk about it in the pulpit. This is the gimmick that we're going to use with Horror of the Blood Monsters. Free to lucky winners, one frozen stiff corpse. And the lucky winner got a frozen chicken. We had the first uh, uh, landing inside the drive-in in a helicopter by Santa Claus. This man by the name of Claude Zell would import monkeys from Africa, and he would build these things called monkey jungles. <laughs> monkey villages? Uh, the monkeys. There were monkey villages? Because I know they had monkeys. Really? What's a monkey village? Literally, he would import live monkeys, build these little sort of African hut-looking affairs, and put them out at the drive-in. They kept them for a good while, and it was an added attraction. <laughs> That's horrible. Oh, yeah, very popular. Very popular. The premier of Blazing Saddles at the Pickwick Drive-In. Normally you would not think of a, uh, a world premiere being done at a drive-in theater, but this is 
blazing saddles, folks. That in order for you to get into that world premiere, you had to be, you had to come in on a horse. And the horses were given horse durs. I'm not sure if the horses ate any of the popcorn they were offered or not, but they were offered it. And I'm not sure, but maybe there were concerts given at drive-ins. Do you remember bands playing? So let's start off with a fine tune, shall we? little thing called the Lumberjacks Call. These would occur during the daytime, maybe a Sunday afternoon. The Austin Symphony had a number of Sunday afternoon concerts at a drive-in. There were eight or nine drive-ins where Cessna planes could fly into the drive-in. They would have back rows with extended length on the speakers so the plane could taxi in you could listen to the movie inside your plane, and then at the end of it, they would have a little tractor pull you off to the runway and you could take off. And we interviewed a man, and he used to think that was the greatest gimmick to get a woman to go out with him, is he could say, you wanna go out flying with me to the drive-in? And he was one of the greatest daters in New Jersey because who else could offer flying to a drive-in? One particular drive-in owner staged a picket line by babysitters. The drive-in was unfair to babysitters because now the family could bring the screaming children. It was so easy. It was very easy. It was easier to go to a drive-in in those days than try to stand in line uh, to go to a movie. Drive-ins did your laundry for you. There were some drive-ins that even ran ads that said they had private telephone system for the businessman. You didn't have to worry about putting your shoes on if you didn't want to. All these served to lure in the drive-in's primary audience, which was... Junior, he's always hungry. As for Sis, she's hungry too. Boy, does Junior go for them. And Sis likes them too. One of the favorite things was going with my brother and sister and my mother and dad, going out there and just, uh, just sit. It didn't make any difference what movie was on. And it was a great way for families to see a movie. It was just the best. You didn't have to have a babysitter. You could take your children. You could have, a, if you had a station wagon or a back seat, you know, you took a couple of blankets and some pillows, you know, and you watched the movie and they went to sleep and it was all right, you know. The walk-in theaters, they basically did not cater to children. Hey kids, how would you like to hear this on the screen instead of the great show you came to see? That's what you sound like. Honest. No, no, no. We can't have noise, folks. I remember lots of adults and kids, too, paid admission to enjoy the show. We must insist on absolute quiet. You'll be glad to know that we provide bottle warming service at refreshment stand. They did a lot of things that appealed to kids because they found out that a lot of times the reason you're going there is, you know, a young couple has three kids and suddenly they can't afford to go to the movies. The drive-in had playgrounds uh, as a convenience for the family, for their children. The playgrounds would have pony rides. Drive-ins had horseback rides, they had mono rockets, they had trains or little uh, little go-karts, and some even had like ponds where you could ride a little motorboat around in the middle of the uh, in the middle of the theater before the movie started. They had every conceivable thing that a child would want to do. So it was almost like a little amusement park. So the child would drive their parents crazy, begging them to go to the drive-in and go early and they used every kind of gimmick to get people to want to come. But anybody that wanted to go, they were welcome. I think movie going is the great equalizer. Whether he was black, brown, yellow, or green, could go in there and watch a movie. But everybody goes to the movies. That goes for the President of the United States or people in you know rural areas or even in ghettos of the cities. Everybody likes to go to the movies. It's intermission time. It's intermission time, folks. And that means it's time for a tasty snack. See you over at the refreshment counter. The exhibitors finally found out that that's where the money was, was in the candy. Popcorn could be sold for 15 cents, which would really cost the drive-in owner maybe a penny and a half or two cents. They had radio speaker systems where you could push a button and order from a central ordering system up at the concession stand. They would have 
waitresses on roller skates who would come to your car. They had carts loaded with food that they dragged around the drive-in where you could go out and buy food from these cart vendors. But drive-ins had cafeteria-style food service. They had uh, four lines. The food was prepackaged. They got very organized at doing this because they only had a brief amount of time. They had to get the food served and they had to do it as fast as they could. There are three minutes remaining before the show starts. We had everything in the snack bar. Cigarettes, here you are. Get the kind you prefer and enjoy them thoroughly. I, I don't know, any, anything you could possibly eat, you could find at the drive-in concession stand. We try, started out because we really didn't know what we wanted to do, so we did everything, mostly hot dogs. Looking for a tempting treat? Hold on till I absorb some heat. We had sandwiches. Let's have a barbecue. Just about everything that you can think of because we were looking for the menu that would make us successful in a snack bar. You could slurp that Coke and chew that popcorn and not uh, bother anybody. I have to tell you that I have never been a junk food eater. Now I'm almost a semi-vegetarian. I'm not into fast foods too much. So I'll fess up to popcorn. 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 Hot dogs. Popcorn. Cold drinks. And... Those days, I liked the corn dogs. I thought those were very nice. Oh, I guess I'd eat some corn dogs. Oh, chili dogs. Oh, chili dogs to die for. A little bit of milk duds if I still had my teeth. I remember that food never looked so ugly as it did in the drive-in promos for the refreshment stand. That were made primarily by a company called Film Mac. I was always wary of that food. Crisp, flavorful fish sandwiches for a snack or a meal. And yet, of course, the whole purpose of those wonderful promotional trailers, which we all love, uh, was to get you to go to the refreshment stand. Way down in old Virginia, 300 years ago, Captain John Smith and Pocahontas shot their meat and aged it slow. So I, I don't understand. Either people uh, blinded themselves to that, or the food wasn't as bad as I thought it was. Pizza! Pizza! Pizza got its kickoff, really, uh, in drive-in movie theaters. Pizza in western parts of the United States was just unknown. People learned to eat pizza at drive-ins. Uh, I would never eat a pizza that looked like the pizza they put on that screen. And it looked like cardboard. It probably tasted like paste, but it was something that people had never eaten before. But see, during the summer, a lot of people didn't stay in their car. People think you only stayed in your car, but back close to the, the concession stand, they had bleachers where people could actually sit outside and, and, and watch the movie. And on many summer nights, these moviegoers who were sitting outside were often treated to these incredible fireworks shows. <laughs> Then came television. Television took a lot of business away from uh, theater. Of course it did, sure. Well, you know, suddenly people could stay home and get visual entertainment. They always had radio, but now they could get visual entertainment for free. The movie-going audience changed. Drive-ins did bring in a different audience. 17 to 23-year-old people. <laughs> They had to get out of the house, and their parents had to get them out of the house to keep their sanity. And the teenagers were left to take control of the driving. Sam Markoff and Jim Nicholson and their American International Pictures uh, counted on that drive-in audience. The major companies didn't really understand the value of young people. Nobody saw that inside this boy there was a lost, lonely wildness. They were the first producers to really aim films at teenagers. The big studios certainly weren't. 
doing that. They classified 8 and 18 as being kids. And they got their films into those drive-in theaters, and they certainly delivered the goods. I mean, look at these. The motorcycle gang, drag strip girl, runaway daughters. It didn't necessarily matter what it was about. War of the Colossal Beast, Blood of Dracula. It mattered that you had a great poster. We decided whether or not a film was going to be made based upon the advertising campaign that we were able to come up with. Jailbait. The shocking story of boy crazy girls. Thousands of young girls are becoming teenage dolls. It was the kind of thing where you would cling to the person next to you in the seat. Boys would take girls and want them to uh, snuggle up a little closer and be scared, and the girls wanted to play coy, and so if they were a little frightened, they could use that as an excuse. Let's not fool ourselves about the purposes of going out on dates. Well, where we learned some of the really important lessons of life. I learned a lot in the drive-in theater. I no, better not tell them. No. I can't tell you about it because my granddaughter's standing right over there. Let's just say they were, you know, Clinton-esque. It was a cheap date. You were fair game at a drive-in. Next morning, you'd find brasiers hanging on the speakers. We'd have ushers that would go to the cars to make sure that they the people were watching the movie and not something else. My skirt goes up in the air and all of a sudden he's jumping on me and getting all excited. We're going along pretty good and he's lifting my sweater and all of a sudden I see that the windows are fogging up. And I, I looked out and I got closer and I said, there's people out there looking in. He said, <laughs> he said yeah, it's just my boys, honey. I said, why? Well, I don't... I'd rather your boys didn't watch, if you don't mind. Well, without drive-ins, America probably loses um, about half its current adult population, I bet. There was one man I met at a party. He told me that his son was conceived at a drive-in playing one of our films. Many people say they were conceived in a drive-in. You know what they said? Many lives were caused by accident last night. I said, what film was it? He said, Angels, Wild Women. They're hot, hard, and mean. Too tough for any man. They force men to submit to their twisted pleasures. The drive-in was the perfect place for the independent filmmaker because it was the first place where he could sell movies without having to go through the studios. It gave the drive-ins an opportunity to play first run. I probably was in, probably in more drive-in movies than most people because I did all these movies, you know, they conquered the world, not of this earth, uh, the alligator people. Uh. In all those science fiction movies, what are you going to say? One was bad, one was good. They were all, they were all pictures that were made, uh, you know, on a low budget uh, and a lot of fun and, and did well and people loved them. You couldn't believe today that as many people went to see them as did go to see them, but you had, you know, stuff like that. Uh, the astounding she monster. <laughs> Well, the brain for Planet Eros, uh, the title speaks for itself. Uh, it's about an alien brain uh, that's going to take over the world, uh, which uh, kills me in the movie and uh, takes over John Agar. It, it certainly wasn't going with the wind, but uh, none of those pictures were expected to be that. In the secondary markets, those films would outgross Gone with the Wind. The jungle becomes the graveyard of man and beast as the mighty herd stampede in panic before the paralyzing fear of these monsters from the green hell. As I open the door, there are these men walking up and down the hall in different stages of being an alligator. However, we have one alligator head, so they decided what they would do is they would put something over the heads of these men. You would see their hands, and then you would know that they were in different stages of being an alligator. However, the thing that they put over their head looked like a man's urinal you know, with special effects. We didn't have any special effects. I mean, what, uh, you know? See a thrill to the terrifying rumble of the first atomic earthquake. The monster in A Conquer the World looked like a big carrot. I mean, everybody said that, but it was scary to people. I was a great screamer. <laughs> That's pretty good. Another kind of drive-in movie was the beach movie. The beach movies were made primarily for the teen market. They took over the drive-in starting in the early 60s. There were several of the beach movies made. You didn't have to watch the whole movie. You could miss five minutes of it. Annette would come back. She was so popular, and people forget how popular she was. She was a major star. 
and her best girlfriend, Shelley Fabres, who was on the Donna Reed show. The two of them couldn't go anywhere without being mobbed, so they'd get in a Nets Thunderbird, and they would go to the drive-in and spend a lot of time in the drive-in. They enjoyed that a lot. If uh, Annette was probably considered the queen of the drive-in, I would bet Deborah Wally is probably the princess of the drive-in. She was in lots of those uh, great, light-hearted, fun, frolicking beach movies. And I think she really captured that whole spirit of, of the drive-in. By the late 60s and early 70s, the movies that you saw at the drive-in really became, they were a bit tough. Um, Films became racier. The naughty stewardesses are what you think they are, and more. You're right, I am a rotten bastard, I admit it. Meet America's wireless gunswingers, Blazing Stewardesses. I saw Blazing Stewardesses. The meaning of exploitation is to exploit a theme. The shocking scenes you're about to see are not suggested for the weak or immature. Any theme that you play up in a gimmick sense, fright, sex. The three Bs, blood, breasts, and beasts. <laughs> It's an unbelievably terrifying experience. When I filmed The Beast of Blood, it was called The Horrors of Blood Island. And I was um, selected or cast by John Ashley, the late John Ashley. But you must see all this for yourself, if you're brave enough. We worked in some grueling conditions. And, uh, you know, in those days, you did all your own stunts. You did everything. So I could have lost my life a couple of times. You fell off horses, you rode horses, you did snakes. There was a pit viper snake right above my head. But it was exciting and wonderful. The significance of what we now think of as drive-in movie is that they had no significance. Probably the cheesier the movie the better the driving experience will be. The hands-down winner was Night of the Living Dead. Maybe even one of them old Lana Turner weepers. For many people, the original zombie movie, certainly the best movie ever made in Pittsburgh. Or you want something scary. With this machine, images are impressed directly on your brain as you see the picture. Now, we know Psychorama is controversial. It's been banned on TV for being too powerful. Stay in your car. Don't panic. Don't be alarmed. But we guarantee it won't hurt you. Sometimes they would have stars from the movies appear for special drive-in premieres. Dr to lure in, uh, lure in crowds. We would go up on the stage and talk to the audience over a microphone that went in, into their car. Uh, Raquel Welch showed up for uh, One Million Years B.C., if you remember that movie. She went down to Fountain Valley, yeah. Really just being there is the attraction that she was. When they premiered um, True Grit, John Wayne came to the Gemini drive-in and uh, stood up on top of the concession stand, shot off his gun several times. Probably one of the most popular things was bringing the beach party gang out to the drive-ins. Literally, there had to be 10 to 15,000 people waiting for them to arrive. Very popular. Well, now when we think of Natalie Wood, we think of one of the greatest stars in Hollywood history. She, like other actresses, had to do promotions, and some of these promotions were at drive-ins. The king of the drive-in is John Ashley. You had somebody who was extremely good looking and a pretty good actor. And then after high school, Caesar, he started doing some of the beach blanket bingo movies. And they were excited to meet John Ashley even before the movie because, you know, he was the king. How did you enjoy America? Oh, it was very nice. What yeah. did you like in particular about it? Uh, all sorts of things. I like, like what? I like the entertainment, the radio, TV, and the drive-in movies and all that, you know. Most people don't realize there were quite a number of drive-ins in other countries. For the information of those who are attending a drive-in theater for the first time, the following hints will make you feel at home and add to your enjoyment. Australia was a big uh, drive-in community. We used to have a lot of the people from Australia come up to the United States to uh, check out what was going on here. Uh, Ultra Martin Snack Bar is now open and ready to serve you. How about fresh fillets of fish with chips and salad, tender steak, banana fritters with rich, full cream. France had a drive-in, Rome had a drive-in. They're going to the movies in Rome, indoors and outdoors. A twist of a knob by the patron brings an English or Italian soundtrack. So the whole idea of the family drive-in theater didn't work in Germany. There was a law in Germany, and it still is, children have to be in their house by, say, 10.30 or 11 o'clock. I know they tried in Japan, but they just couldn't not get enough land. If you think about it, what are you going to use a drive-in for on Sunday morning? Well, a, the drive-in was a great place, a very relaxed place 
for a church service. America had about 80 drive-in churches. Take your family to church each week. Use your freedom to worship as you please. On Easter, they'd have a sunrise Easter service for churches. And a gentleman named Robert Schuler, who's probably the most successful preacher on television today. He could not find a place that he found suitable to start his church, so he rented the Orange Drive-In. And when Norman Vincent Peale agreed to come for a guest appearance at that drive-in, he had 4,000 people show up. Often the music would be very, what we call, hip. People would honk their horns in displeasure because they really wanted traditional music at church, even though they might be sitting there in their shorts or their bathing suit because they were going to go to the lake after they went to the church service. You know, fellas, I spent half of my life flashing across that big silver screen there. The one just like it. Well, you're holding up a lot better than some of those screens are, Chill. Yeah, I know television has dimmed a lot of them around the country, but like the fella says, it's the change in time. So in the 1970s, some of the drive-ins started to fail, not so much because of their attendance. They were just wearing out. The underground speaker systems, the wiring wore out. Don't let this happen to your car. Be sure to remove the speaker before you leave. It was very expensive to redo this. That's why a lot of drive-in owners went to AM and FM sound. They portray it as a better sound system, but in reality, it was easier and cheaper to have the sound come over the radio because you didn't have to dig up all of the speakers and replace all of the wiring. One of the things that saved many drive-ins is that they became multiplex drive-ins. In the first instance, they would make three drive-ins out of one, which is just a matter of cutting off certain areas. In the middle 60s, we said, what could we do with the drive-in theaters during the daytime? And we said, well, what about flea markets? And somebody said, well, we don't like the name of flea market, so we're going to call it a swap meet. Swap meets have kept certain drive-ins going. If it wasn't for the swap meets, I'm sure the drive-ins would be, would be closed earlier. When the indoors wanted to try to do something to keep the drive-ins from being successful, they uh, put an issue on the ballot to uh, get end, uh, I, I should say, to start daylight saving time. Daylight savings time was terrible for drive-ins. The drive-ins would have to start at least an hour later. It got dark so late that the evening was half over or over by the time you could start the movie. I, I know that there were some owners of walk-ins that felt that that would really help them if they could knock the drive-ins out of the box. Owners were trying to come up with new ways to lure people in, and somebody hit on this idea of showing porn at the drive-in. Am I the seventh or the eighth today? You are the 69th. Your life is nothing to be proud of. You bastard, get him. People could see these movies driving down the street. Life to me is just one big orgasm. I don't know how many accidents have happened of people watching the screen driving down the road when you'd see just a giant pair of breasts or a nude woman on the screen, it would just be something that you were going to look at. Towns that were upset because these theaters are sitting in the middle of normally residential neighborhoods. And I'm standing here in the parking lot of the Mountain View Apartments, one block away, and I have a clear view over that present fence. If you imagine having a porno playing on a, a probably a 50 by 80 foot screen, in your backyard, it'd probably be kind of awkward. And to do away with that problem, drive-in owners built screens next to their drive-ins. They planted cedar trees that would grow up 60 feet tall. The new fence must be erected to a height at least as high as the present fences. So I think it's a shame that people traded in pretty much the drive-in for the VCR. And that's largely what happened. Drive-ins offer something totally different than what kids today are seeking. Developers love drive-ins. There's, there's all this land that they don't have to do anything to that they can buy at one fell swoop. Tear down the drive-in. Because the value of the property is exceeding the gross that they can get out of the theater itself. Great many of them, as I said, have been turned into shopping centers. We don't have the ability anymore to use land without getting a big return on our money. Now, you have a multiplex. Drive-in theaters had a great place.
place in history for American film going. It's much more economic and the young people go. It, it was a phase of film going in the United States which has come and gone. It isn't because the drive-in wasn't okay. It's just because this is a better system. They got one projectionist and they got three dollar popcorn. That uh, cars that are built uh, are not drive-in uh, friendly because you can't turn off the headlights. It was a wonderful era, it's too bad it's gone. They weren't built to last forever. Nothing lasts forever. A drive-in, when it's, when it's through, when it's closed, is like a graveyard. Have you ever thought that? There's nothing sadder in the world than an abandoned drive-in. You get a, a, a chill, you know. It's a, you feel, what a shame, what a waste, it's gone. You know, something that was so great at one time, and there it was, full of people and fun, and a big movie up there, and, and hundreds and hundreds of people in their cars enjoying it, and now the wind blows and there's nothing there. I miss driving, Tim, very much. I miss the driving, because as soon as you say drive-in, it brings back memories. You remember, just like some people remember what they were doing the day Kennedy was killed. You remember what you did at the drive-ins and who you were with. This part of your life. Miss them. Every year, every two years, there's like articles in the paper saying, the drive-in is dead, the drive-in is gone, there's no more drive-in. But that's been going on for 40 years. But very uh, pleasantly, I have been reading that drive-ins are making a comeback. Drive-ins are beginning to have somewhat of a comeback. In smaller cities. And in a lot of these small towns where a huge theater or a megaplex or something hasn't come into town, the drive-in's still this really important social center, if you will, for families again. The drive-in's low ebb was in the early 90s, but today more than 40 drive-ins have either been reopened or built from scratch. Where I'm from in Nebraska, I know there was a guy who built a drive-in just a couple years ago. I, I would like to see some daring entrepreneurs figure out a way to bring back the drive-in. If anybody out there rich enough to throw away a whole bunch of money to open a chain of drive-ins. I'll guarantee you, you build it and they will come. If there's one person left that likes to go to outdoor movies, that person will do something to keep drive-ins alive today. It's something that, uh, that was, as you said, part of Americana. I could get with one of these Elvis Presley look-alikes and do it all over again. <laughs> Although I think there always will be a few th drive-in theaters around, but I think it'll be more for the nostalgia experience. So drive-ins capture more memories than just, oh, I saw this great movie, instead it was, oh, we had this amazing time. Or, Whenever oh, we were driving this, anywhere, this if we passed a drive-in so screen. I got all excited. It was a great and time in my movie. life, and I wouldn't out. trade it for anything. I love the drive-in movies. On these great nights when the sky was lavender and... And every person we mention drive-in movies to stops a moment and smiles. And we can see them reminisce. It reminds them of their youth and maybe being in the car in the front seat with the crush of their life. And they were a good thing, and I hope that they will always be on the landscape. The people that went to them, like me, like you, they'll live with us forever.
Are y'all done? We are. I think I'm gonna get horseback and go down there and ride with her. We hope you have a wonderful time. Come back soon.